The Department of Science and Technology is a national government department that aims to boost socio-economic development in South Africa through research and innovation. One of the key aspects of this is the generation and dissemination of knowledge, learning and evidence to inform and influence how science and technology may be used to achieve inclusive development. This government um, has prioritized rural development and because we are a department of science and technology that has a mandate to then look at knowledge to solve problems, we therefore partner with certain government departments in order then to understand what are the problems or the challenges they have and how can we use the knowledge that we generate in the institutions that we finance to solve those problems. We are looking at ways and means of ensuring that uh, innovation is used to improve service delivery but also to ensure that the rural communities have got access to infrastructure. So that's the context in which this uh, Innovation uh, Partnership for Rural Development Program was established. The intention was to say how do we introduce innovation in municipalities, how do these municipalities adopt uh, these uh, uh, technologies and innovation to improve service delivery. The South African Constitution gives all citizens the right to dignity. The provision of sanitation forms part of this basic right, regardless of where you may live. Low-pore flush toilets combine the advantages of both waterborne and VIP systems, while eliminating their disadvantages. Developed for the South African rural landscape, the low-pore flush toilets incorporate twin leach pits, with filling rates depending on the number of people using the toilet and the ground conditions. The project was successfully piloted in the Eastern Cape, Northern Cape and Mpumalanga. It was hard. When we want to pee, we went to the forest. Even if it's dark, it's easy. My life is easy. Because the toilets are nearby. It's easy to go to the toilet. Even it's, when it's dark, flashlights to go to the toilet. In 2014, a South African point of use technology was developed to address the issue of access to safe drinking water. Household point-of-use water treatment devices are an excellent alternative for immediate and safe water provision in rural communities. The technology developed meets the World Health Organization standards for safe drinking water. The project was implemented in Capricorn District Municipality and Bizana in the Eastern Cape. The woven fabric microfiltration gravity filter point-of-use technology is driven by gravity alone, requires no water treatment chemicals and is robust, simple to operate and easy to maintain. Small hydropower schemes can play a critical role in providing energy access to remote areas in South Africa. As a result, the small-scale hydropower project was introduced at Mtlontlo local municipality in order to provide a rural community with grid quality and reliable electricity supply, so improving the standard of living of the receiving community. The project has seen significant impact on the quality of life of the Kwamadiba community. The design of the Kwamadiba small-scale hydropower system has proven the feasibility and technical possibility of small-scale hydropower installations for rural electrification. The integrated algal ponding system was implemented in rural towns in the Eastern Cape. This project focused on creating a demonstration-scale wastewater treatment works, while also creating a viable platform to launch sustainable food security and job creation in vulnerable communities. Another project looking at treatment of wastewater is that of the algal-based treasury treatment in maturation ponds of wastewater treatment works. This project implemented a self-sustaining system that is independent of electricity or expensive chemicals to allow for the effective removal of pathogens from wastewater treatment works effluent. The project was implemented at the Motetema Wastewater Treatment Works in the Greater Sekukune District Municipality. The environmentally friendly treatment method supported a reduction in human health risk downstream. The Municipal Services Corrective Action Request and Report System, CARS, is an incident management system with a strong focus on enforcing accountability. This will improve the manner in which municipalities handle queries that are reported by communities. Further innovations linked to this project are currently being piloted. These include the setup of community-based organization water service providers that will decentralize some of the basic maintenance work to ordinary communities and so support job creation. 
Nation. The Smart Giza project was initiated to address the challenges of water scarcity and lack of awareness of water as a scarce commodity in South Africa. This project used the influence of another resource, electricity, to raise awareness of the cost and quantity of water usage in a household. The project focused on control of geysers, measuring and managing electricity supply, temperature settings and water supply. Minute-by-minute minute information is presented to the users in an easily digestible format, either online or in the form of an app on users' cell phones. The Water Safety Planning and Wastewater Risk Abatement Plans is a key element of risk management planning. The purpose of the project is to assist in the assessment of current practices at the identified municipalities, including the provision of guidance and technical support where required. It focuses on the development of new risk management for both water and wastewater risk management at challenged district municipalities. The Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal were the target provinces for the first rollout of this project. Step on the top story this hour. The Science and Technology Youth Journalism Program was implemented to promote the interest in science and technology amongst disadvantaged youth. Given that community media tends to focus on reporting such as crime, politics and sport, a need was identified to expand the range of community media to cover science and technology. The Science and Technology Youth Journalist Program was implemented in district municipalities where other IPRDP technologies have been demonstrated. The project has dramatically increased the amount of science reporting by community media and interns are contributing in terms of science-related stories. Feedback from community media is positive. As DST, we look forward to improving the contribution that we make to support what we're trying to achieve through the National Development Plan and other programs. It's uh, important for, for a department like Science and Technology to be at the kind of center of our national development efforts and we think through programs like the IPRDP and other programs that we have in the DST that collectively we're making a contribution to the three core things that we see uh, as, as requiring the attention of everyone in South Africa. That is, how do we deal with poverty, how do we deal with inequality, and how do we deal with unemployment? We as a Department of Science and Technology have demonstrated that science and technology can be used to improve people's lives. And therefore, we hope that that will help us and the rest of government to fulfill the mandate that uh, they wanted of uh, making sure that people's lives are improved. From the Department of Science and Technology perspective, we think it is extremely important to get the public also excited about the fact that science should not be seen as something that is done by a few individuals uh, with white coat somewhere in the laboratory, it's something that can uh, be used to change people's lives. I just wanted to first of all start with a good morning and welcome to all the speakers, all the attendees and the organizers. I see we are about 160 attendees so far, so there's a lot of interest in the session today and I can assure you, you are not going to be disappointed. Um, there's lots of really interesting stuff. Um, uh, I'm going to be introducing our first speaker uh, in a minute, Mr. Tsipang Masia. Um, but before I do that, let me just briefly give you an introduction to ASAP. I think most of the attendees today are familiar with the science and technology landscape in South Africa. But for those who are not, ASAP is the Academy of Science of South Africa, established in 1996 by the then President Mandela. Um, and it consists of about 600 appointed members. So these would be members of the scientific academic community, mainly within South Africa. And I hasten to add a very efficient secretariat, I can assure you, who manage the daily activities of the Academy. So what does it do? Well, you'll find all that information on the SF website, including its objectives, its role, and of course, news about all of its programs and its activities. For me, the most important statement is ASAP aims to provide evidence-based scientific advice on issues of public interest to government and other stakeholders. Um, and that's partly the reason that ASAP is involved in this project. But I need to add to that objective, its important role in, in which is undertaken through its scholarly publishing unit um, in terms of the management of SIELO South Africa, the open science platform 
and the South African Journal of Science. Um, SF's contribution to MIMI, so I'll, I'll explain. MIMI, of course, you know, is the Municipal Innovation Maturity Index, and I'll just talk about MIMI from henceforth, has been mainly to support the development of the initial concept note and the preparation of a preliminary report. And so my role today is exactly that. I'm going to be continuing the supportive role to MIMI, um, and I'm going to uh, now move on to what are we here for today. So it's 20 past already and we're not yet at the uh, core purpose of what we're going to be doing today but to quote from the invitation the overarching objective of the launch event is to introduce MIMI to the wider local government stakeholders and there are 160 stakeholders on the seminar which is very gratifying to see and welcome to all of you um, so MIMI is a self-assessment and a reflective tool that assesses innovation performance practices and maturity levels of municipalities. Um, and those who you're familiar with the science and technology policy landscape know that measurement and um, response is very important, very critical um, in, um, in the whole in policy place, a space and especially in policy experimentation. So this event will share the preliminary report of, of the municipal innovation measurements based on the insight emerging from the pilot phase of this index. So that statement gives me the perfect entry point for Tsipang. And at this point, then I would like to um, hand over to Tsipang, but I just want to uh, give a little bit of background. Um, so Tsipang is a acting chief director for science, technology and innovation for sustainable human settlements in the Department of Science and Innovation. Um, he is presently doing a PhD in human settlements and construction management at NMMU um, in the Eastern Cape. And his research topic is about enhanced people's housing process and income opportunities. So I think that gives me the sufficient um, opportunity at this point. So I'd like to uh, give the platform then to Tsipang to explain to us the objectives of the session, the purpose of the IID seminar. Well, thank you very much, Professor Valvin, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning once again to everyone attending. Um, we host the Innovation for Inclusive Development Seminar in partnership with ASAF, and we are very excited also to have our partners who are working with us on the Municipal Innovation Maturity Index attending today. Uh, these seminars typically are organized uh, by the department as a way of creating a space for engagement uh, with sector stakeholders, but in particular with government decision makers. Um, we, we organize these seminars uh, to uh, showcase knowledge, evidence, and learning that emanates from technologies that we pilot as a department. You have just seen the video now. So we demonstrate technology projects, but as we demonstrate this technology project, we collect knowledge, evidence, and learning that can inform policy and influence government's uh, policy. Uh, so DSI has in the past been sponsoring these IID seminars. Uh, so that we are able to have uh, policy dialogue uh, discussions. But it is mainly to showcase technologies and decision support tools that have got a potential for uh, widespread adoption in government and also technologies and decision support tools that can actually uh, improve service delivery and help us uh, achieve a capable state as we know um, that's being the vision expressed in the NDP uh, Vision 2030. So in this instance, the Municipal Innovation Maturity Index is a decision support tool that we see having potential for widespread adoption, especially in municipalities. And also a decision support tool that can help encourage municipalities to upscale and uh, take up innovations. Now we have funded this uh, pilot implementation of this tool uh, in partnership with the South African Local Government Association, SALGA, 
the Human Sciences Research Council, the University of KwaZulu Natal. And uh, we then went into this partnership, clearly asking uh, these three institutions to look at developing the tool itself, but also piloting the tool and uh, reaching this milestone that we see today where uh, we want to roll the tool uh, out uh, nationally. Now you will all know pilot implementation is more about testing if a system is fit for purpose, but also testing in real life uh, if that uh, system uh, can actually uh, achieve what, what is realistic and what it is set out uh, to, to achieve. So the report that is being presented here is basically emanating from a pilot implementation uh, process uh, to test uh, and to, to learn and, and to see how we can replicate and roll out uh, this tool at a national scale. So we had to go through a pilot implementation process uh, to test that. And then the, this ID seminar will obviously share with you a report of innovation measurements in municipalities. It is our belief also that it provides a blueprint, it provides a model of more robust reporting uh, to come in future about uh, innovation practices in municipalities. Um, now, what I want to mention also, uh, Professor, and to everyone attending, is that uh, there are a series of engagements that we have planned with municipalities who participated in the pilot. Uh, we will be undertaking these, um, I think, as learning forums in the month of August, just to provide them with feedback uh, on innovation practices as they participated in the pilot. Uh, the MIMI partners that you see are, uh, attending today uh, will use such engagements to refine the tool, but also to strengthen the uh, data collection mechanisms. Uh, I think we're looking at an option also to strengthen uh, data that is collected by way of providing evidence. Uh, so as a Department of Science and Innovation, we are very excited uh, for this pilot implementation report that's being shared here today. And we firmly believe that it provides an opportunity to support a country's smart city agenda and other related initiatives in the country about uh, smart cities. Uh, the DSI is also pleased about the partnership. I think the partnership that we forged with uh, Salga, we are very, very much pleased about this and the uh, HSRC and UKZN. But also just the contribution of Salga in the process, I think that, that is, uh, 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 appreciated uh, their commitment and the adaptive leadership displayed by the UKZN uh, a team that has been leading the pilot implementation under the leadership of Dr. Mieni and Dr. Okem, as well as the agility of the HSRC team uh, led uh, by Dr. Peter Jacobs. As a department, we really appreciate your contribution. We have seen this as a transformative initiative that's very complex. Uh, which really required people who can be able to lead innovation in a in a in a very uh, complex environment. In conclusion, just, just interrupt you briefly, uh, Tsepang, There was a request to put your for your slides to be put on presentation mode. I'm not sure if there's a reason why you haven't done that, but if yeah, there we go. That's much right. better. Okay, thank you. In conclusion, uh, Professor, we as a department are really encouraged by the participation of municipalities here. And I think the department will also continue to uh, set up instruments and programs that will be designed to support municipalities to adopt innovation, to improve service delivery in the context of the district development model, as well as in the context of the DSI's mandate and uh, the DSI's decadal plan and the uh, science technology innovation white paper. Uh, we really are looking forward to a more fruitful engagement at the seminar here. The agenda lineup is really exciting. I'm looking forward to the next presentation uh, about an international perspective of innovation measurements in the public sector. And also the keynote address that will be delivered our, by our DSI DG, the messages of support from the DVC UKZN, the acting CEO HSRC, and the insights that will come from uh, uh, Department of Cooperative Governance around transformative, digital transformation and innovation in the context of smart uh, city framework. 
as well as the MIMI pilot report itself that will be presented earlier, uh, later on, including uh, lessons learned and challenges that we have experienced in setting up the initiative. So with those words, Professor, we really hope um, that there will be an increased participation of municipalities in the MIMI rollout. And uh, I would like to really wish everyone a productive and a fruitful engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan. That was brilliant. And you also saved us a bit of time, which we're going to need. So our next speaker, as you've indicated, um, and I know I'm going to struggle to pronounce Professor Mehmet Demircioglu's surname. Briefly, just a few words of introduction. Um, so your uh, Professor Demircioglu is an assistant professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore and a research fellow at Arizona State University and Indiana University Bloomington. Um, his main research focus is public sector innovation and his work is published in Research Policy, Governance, Public Management Review, Journal of Technology Transfer, Small Business Economics, and a number of other important academic journals. So we very much look forward to the input that you're going to be making. Um, it's always incredibly important to get an international perspective. And so uh, I now give you the floor um, and thank you very much for participating in this program. Thank you very much, Professor David and Waldin. So yeah, actually I, you don't need to pronounce my uh, last name. So that's the reason I encourage my friends or students to tell my first name. So, and, uh, and I am originally from Turkey, although I've been in South Africa once for a conference and my PhD advisor, Sergio Fernandez, he frequently uh, visits South Africa. So he has an academic affiliation in South Africa. And I hope you see my slide. So if there is any issues, uh, please do let me know. So again, uh, it's a great pleasure to talk about my research, public sector innovation, that I have been working on since 2009, when I was an MPA, Master of Public Affairs student. And um, the more I do research on innovation, and the more I feel that there are so many gaps, particularly in terms of measurement of innovation. And today I will mostly talk about how to measure innovation, particularly from international perspective, which could be adaptable to the cities and other government organizations. And I will also briefly talk about uh, why to measure innovation and providing a few examples about how we can measure innovation systematically. And before I go further, uh, I want to make sure that we are all, all in the same page in terms of definitions. And the first important definition is what do we mean with public sector or municipal government? So any organization owned and funded by governments typically, and if they do not aim to make profits, we call it public sector or public organization. So in this regard, municipal governments are part of public sector or all, or all the ministers or agencies, they are public sector. And the second definition, what is innovation, right? Innovation is not as same as invention because in innovation, it is new or novel idea or practice for a public organization. So it can be new to an organization or a municipal government, but it may not be necessarily new to the entire South African public service. In fact, innovation, kind of adoption of type of innovation is encouraged because you do not need to spend money or resources to try out new ideas if something is working in another municipal government. And of course, the context matters. And I'll briefly talk about the context later. So first, I wanna start with the quote of one of my first papers. Although the paper is about public policy, but I think the same logic could be applicable to innovation research. 
if the function of advising the emperors, kings, sultans in the past can be considered a traditional kind of public policy analysis, then the study of public policy is as old as history. However, in a modern sense, in terms of multidisciplinary, action-focused, problem orientation, right, multi-method, it is relatively new compared to, say, political science, right? I think the same logic is applicable to innovation. And uh, if you look at the history from like all the military advancements, maybe building like China wall and everything, right? So these are actually innovation. However, in terms of multi-method, structured, well-designed, action-oriented, public sector innovation is very new. And, um, I'll also talk about some historical developments. But before I go further, people ask me, like, why innovation, right? Why public sector innovation? Of course, innovation is crucial uh, for efficiency, legitimacy of organizations. But these are also part of our essential lives. Look at the education, health, security, right? If there is no innovation and it may be difficult for citizens to live together. For example, camera, maybe the camera protects people, and but although it may have some unexpected consequences as well. So in this regard, innovations are affecting our lives, but somewhat tricky as well, because each innovation may bring unexpected consequences. And in recent discussions, the grand challenges are complexity, issues. So innovation can solve those bigger problems, such as migration today that we see. And the recent literature demonstrate and provide clear evidence that if public organization is innovative, it provides positive impact to other private organizations. And the common examples are actually from Singapore. Singapore public service is innovative, so as firms in Singapore as well. Of course, they interact with each other, but if the municipal government is innovative, innovative it may attract more opportunities for, from the business sector. If you look at the early studies of public sector innovation, it started in 1960s, but 1960s, they are mostly about theoretical contributions. And later on in the 1970s and 80s, there are so many case studies, they look at best best practices and try to generalize the findings. But people ask me like, what is new here, right? The new issue or the new finding or new concept is the measurement of innovation with using the innovation surveys. Because the idea of survey is you collect data from individuals, from organizations, and then you try to identify whether there are any types of innovations, whether innovation works or not, and you try to measure employee attitude in terms of innovation, leaders' attitude and behavior, whether they encourage innovation or discourage innovation. So because of this, most of the research on public sector innovation started after 2010. And in fact, I was really impressed with the Innovation Maturity Index by you. And I was very happy to be part of this discussion here because you have trying to measure like what is going on here and how to improve it. In fact, these are kind of a core understanding of innovations because when you collect data, which is representative and you can in fact um, generalize some of the findings here and you can see a pattern or several patterns and you can identify something is working and maybe other, others are not working. So in fact, these are really valuable tools. And uh, if you look at the academic literature, the last five years or six years, you can see an increasing number of innovation studies and mostly because of the, these kind of surveys. There are, for example, now Korean Innovation Index surveys, and then hopefully there will be more research in the Innovation Index uh, you know, innovation using innovation maturity index in South Africa. So these are really, really promising topics. And I really hope that 
many of researchers, like many participants here, can use those surveys to advance the literature, advance what we know, and also offer insights to the practitioners and uh, to the particularly like developing but very promising countries like South Africa, like Brazil, right? So I think in this regard, uh, innovation is really, really in in important topic. And you may ask me like, what should we study, right? Or what are the study topics? So these are some research that has been conducted, which offer insight to policymakers as well. Some of the researcher and practitioners they are interested in the uh, innovation as dependent variable. So what I mean innovation as dependent variable is what are the drivers of innovation? What are the conditions for innovation, right? So then you may identify like what leads innovation, maybe experimentation, maybe feedback loops, maybe resources. So these are really important connection to understand why some agencies are more innovative, why some municipal governments are more innovative. And the second kind of bigger theme for innovation research is we consider innovation as independent variable. So the question becomes here, so what? Okay, we understand there is an innovation in this agency or this city, right? What happens? And then you look at, let's say performance of the city. And you look at whether foreign investment on that particular city or city development or growth, right? Or unemployment rate. And you can really find whether this particular innovation, it may be more about product innovation, maybe process innovation, maybe technological innovation, whether there is any impact to the important outcomes like performance. And the, thir and the third set of bigger research question or research analysis, again, it also impacts the practical implication is where the ideas come from. Who are the main source? Are there like government officials? Are there citizens? Maybe in cities, citizens come together. Maybe there are like meetings with the citizens and they may offer some feedback to solve some of the problems that cities are facing. It may be like bottom-up innovation. But in other cases, government may dictate you, okay, you need to complete those innovation. And then you can look at, maybe you can compare those innovations that are top down and other innovations, maybe bottom up or maybe more collaborative innovation. And whether, again, like you can link to the maybe second aspect, whether the innovation increases performance. And the other aspect is types of innovation. Like, are you interested in product innovation, kind of service innovation, or maybe citizen satisfaction, right? So again, because of the need or the problems that you are facing, so then you can change the focus of the innovation. And of course, many of the research nowadays, they also look at the climate, okay? Whether leaders encourage innovation to employees, whether there are brainstorming, there are creativity is encouraged, right? And you look at, again, like the first and second aspect, Okay, well, if there is a creativity, do they increase innovation or do they really increase performance? Then you can look at it. And there are also other research happening such as main target of innovation, the barriers to innovation, and some research look at the development time and resources and why some innovation takes longer time to implement, whereas some innovations are less time to implement. And what should be our focus, right? Because cities, governments, so we have limited budget and time. So if the innovation takes a lot of time, right? It also means that perhaps we are not really spending enough time for other, other types of issues that cities are facing. So long story short, measurement of innovation includes questions that journalists ask, right? If you ask a journalist that they report, they ask questions like what, why, how, when, where, and so on. So these are the questions that we really want to understand. Ask the questions, and these are the questions that offer uh, feedback 
to the citizens or offer uh, solutions to the problems that cities or citizens are facing. And why to measure innovation? Very briefly, if we can measure something, we can understand. And if the leaders or we can understand, the leaders can manage and lead. So, and we can also compare different municipalities, cities, like which organizations are doing better than others, right? And also innovation is typically linked with the success. And you can also promote cities or employees who are more innovative, right? So that will be another important aspect. So now I will briefly talk about how to measure innovation. The first step is we need to decide what is our focus. Are we interested in employee creativity or are we interested in municipal governments or national governments? So based on different unit, the needs or the resources may be different. So for example, in municipal governments, maybe you may look at e-government issues, you may look at technological process innovations, and for individual level, you may look at whether individuals are motivated to innovate. So again, there may be different studies that researchers can study and different maybe uh, levels that practitioners, policymakers can learn from those levels. And another issue is, are you interested in quality or quantity? So maybe some municipal governments like Seoul City Hall, in South Korea or Seoul metropolitan government that I also work there, they are interested in number of innovations that employees can bring. So they provide bonuses to the employees who offer some innovative ideas, okay? But some other municipal governments, they may look at, okay, provide me one idea each year, only one, the best idea, okay? And it also affects the researcher's focus so, because there would be different kind of um, factors affecting many innovations versus one big innovation, which may be more radical or complex innovation. And some other research they look at, should we focus on like the last six months, maybe only one year or the last three years? Again, radical innovations may take longer time to implement. So again, like you may assess what is your need? Do you need immediate innovations, but more incremental? If so, the time horizon would be like shorter, maybe six months or a year maximum. But if your focus is radical innovations, then maybe two or three years. And in terms of methods, again, municipal innovation maturity index in South Africa, it is very impressive, right? So this kind of surveys would be crucial, but you can also use some interviews as well to combine a survey, which kind of gives you a bigger picture, like what is happening, right? So interviews can help you to see like the so what questions or what why questions. So it is again up to you to decide what to do. And the next category is what should we include? Like including like innovation maturity index, or in our interviews. So you can ask questions on source of innovation, again, like top-down versus bottom-up, like who are more influencing innovation, that particular innovation maybe. What are the conditions for innovation? So you can talk with the policymakers and saying that, okay, tell us why there are barriers to innovation or why some conditions work for you, but not other conditions. Or who are the main target? Like why you are making that particular innovation, right? So you can add the questions in your survey, but you can also ask questions in your interview as well. Types of innovation, like is it like product or process, right? And also you may ask questions about development time, objectives, and whether the particular innovation increases performance, increases efficiency, or maybe improving process or in increasing the quality. Again, the context always matters. So based on different contexts, your focus may be different. Some organizations may be more product orientation organizations. Some organizations more be more process oriented. And the outcomes I think is very important because 
many innovations fail. Even if they are successful, it may increase the cost. And in fact, in my research that I conducted in Australian public service, and in also in Italy, like some of Japan and Turkey as well, some innovations fail, uh, even make the process worse. So you expect that innovations make your life easier, but it, it increases the cost of the process because it becomes more complex to understand so that innovation is not successful. So uh, I think I would suggest you that perhaps focusing on the benefits or outcomes are more important. So whether innovation is increasing, let's say uh, quality uh, or citizen satisfaction or your employee job satisfaction as well, and that you may focus here. And of course, there are other aspects like target and objectives as well. Prof Mehmet, just, so, to, in, sorry, just to interrupt you briefly, um, I don't know how you're going. According to my timekeeping, you've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so I don't want to shorten your, the key material you're presenting, but just, yes. to keep you, just to keep you on track. Thank you very much. So I'll finish in one minute. So these are again, like the same slide that I demonstrate, public sector innovation research. And I just want you to like show two of my research. So one of my research, I show that, well, what are the conditions for innovation? And these are the like conditions, experimentation, responding to low performance, feedback, motivation to improve performance and, but budget costs do not affect. So another research, like we look at more systematic way, individual level, group level, organizational level and employee level. So these are some findings from the Australian public service. You can search in Google and you can find um, some of those information about what type of questions that, that they are asking you. So the last thing I want to talk is in OECD, uh, there is a, you can check it like OPSI website. You can look at their innovations as well. These are, um, these are the ones uh, they submitted agencies submitted all over the world about the innovation index. So just think about them, discuss innovative activities in your agencies and think like there are any issues and how today concept could be applicable to your organizations, your municipal governments. And then um, please try to construct and develop scale scalable and implemental ideas. And again, the MIMI Municipal Innovation Maturity Index, very promising and I hope there will be more research and practice using that survey and advanced advances. So thank you again very much. And uh, I'll look forward to your questions if you have any questions. Thank you ever so much, Prof Mehmet. Just leave that last slide up for a minute because I'm not sure that we all followed. So the OECD OPSI um, site, that is where you submit a case study for evaluation or what would be the purpose yeah. of that site? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. David. So that um, OECD, uh, although South Africa is I think not OECD country, but uh, still countries from all over the world, they submit their best innovation cases to those websites. And I also checked whether there are any submissions from South Africa. And I found that there are six or seven successful innovation cases submitted by South African agencies. And I didn't see that they are from a municipal level, but they are, I think, community level, kind of non-profit level or the government level. So the idea is that if you innovate something and if you think that there is an innovation, you submit your case to those OPSI websites. And I think there are currently over 500, the best cases. And based on these cases, uh, they can evaluate, because I know the, those people in OECD, uh, so they evaluate whether these innovation could be included in their websites. So, and uh, they accept cases uh, randomly as well. So you can just go over and submit your innovation, which is adapted maybe in the last year or two or you can uh, submit based on their annual call for innovations. So in some, you can even randomly submit your innovation if there is any innovation. And I believe uh, there are many innovations conducted by the municipal governments in South Africa. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Prof Mehmet, for your presentation and 
that um, overview really of innovation in the public sector. What does it mean? What is, what is the definition of public sector and what are the different types of surveys? Um, I, I think we've got now how much, we've got uh, 20 minutes uh, or 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, we have a couple in the, uh, the kind of Q&A section. I'm just asking all participants to post their questions if they've got any. Um, two of these are uh, questions that don't relate to the, this initial presentation. So there's one question, is there a link available to the MIMI index reports and data sets? And then would the CMM maturity model by PMI be helpful? Um, so let's, um, let's first of all take the question about would the CMM maturity model by PMI be helpful? Now, I, I have no idea about those acronyms. I think PMI might be the Project Management Institute and the CMM might be um, something, I don't know. Um, okay, so uh, yes, it is the Project Management Institute, but we don't know what CMM. I'm not sure, um, Mehmet, if you would be able to answer that, is that something you uh, that you know about? Is that uh, I'm not very familiar, maybe. Uh, I, maybe it is better not to answer by me, but what I can just tell briefly is um, I think every model and every innovation index are very valuable. And think about innovation applicable to our lives as well. Some innovations may fail, right? But the process itself brings so many values to us. So this type of models can offer insights and we can use the models, existing models to improve further and adapt to the local context. And based on the, our need, we can also um, use different maybe survey questions. So if your focus is, let's say, targets of innovation, then you may ask questions measuring targets. If your focus is outcomes of innovation, you may ask whether the innovation increase cost or reduce the cost and how it impacts the innovation. So again, I'm not very familiar with the change measures, the model here, but using these and advancing these would be very beneficial. That, that would okay, be thanks. Nice. Thank okay. you. Um, maybe stop sharing your slides and yes, we can go I'll back stop. to the, there we go. Um, Thank you. So, I, I mean, I, I was very interested in that article from Research Policy. That's your most highly cited article. Um, and, I, and I'm just reading to you the last sentence because this is my question. Um, you know, usually you have these Q&A sessions and are there any questions? And there's this, this, just this deathly silence. You think that everyone has died. Um, and I call it the silicon silence because it's, you know, it's not clear whether anyone's even listening to you, just talking to yourself. But um, so I've got a question, so we don't have to get stuck in a silicon silence. But the question is, so if I'm reading this, it says, the results of the study suggest that the intrinsic factors such as experimentation and motivation to improving performance are crucial for achieving innovation in the public sector. So I've got the two questions, first of all, relate to public sector. I mean, the, the understanding of the public sector is that they must just do the work that they've been asked to do. You know, they need to issue ID documents and make sure that there are a sufficient police presence in a particular area and, um, that the health system works. And so there's this, um, it's really a kind of an emphasis on doing the routine tasks, the operational tasks, doing those well. And um, organizations tend to struggle with, with this concept of ambidexterity, where ambidexterity would refer to being able to be innovative and entrepreneurial and try new things and break the rules and think out of the box, all of those aspects, which we you know, which we typically associated with entrepreneurial organizations and not with the public sector. So how, how do you manage to, in a single organization, combine these two cultures? Yeah. How do you think that's possible? Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. David. So it's a great question. And um, there is, I think, big debates about like somewhat should organization theory more important than behavior. So theory is more about strategy, design and the mission, right? The behavior is whether about like experimentation, whether employees motivation to innovate and uh, their satisfaction. And um, 
then I relate that question to the public sector reforms. So we know that like South Africa faced the reforms, New Zealand, Australia, like many developed and developing countries are like experimenting, experimenting reforms, particularly since the 1980s. The researchers find that most of the time, like more political scientists, maybe Christopher Hood or like Paulit and so on, uh, what should, why, some gov, why some reforms fail and why some are successful, right? Because on the one hand, we want to encourage entrepre entrepreneurship, innovation, right? But why some of the innovation attempts brings more corruption, right? Entrepreneurship maybe undermines the public value. And they find that actually there are many studies since the 1980s. If you have, so again, like in terms of government level, or in terms of organization level. If you have a, a routine task well established, there is a clear accountability system. And uh, if there is a high trust, and then this type of risky, like innovative activities, entrepreneurship can in fact increase innovation and performance. But if there is not enough institutionalization, or if the system is already corrupted, and if uh, again, there is not clear accountability systems. And then you try to make reforms leading like more privatization or more about market-based type of innovations, right? It may fail or it may even increase bribery or corruption because again, the system is not well established. So in my research, if you look at the Australian public service, and I also look at like some of the research in the United States and UK, uh, where, where like the corruption is less and uh, the punishment of the like bribery or corruption is severe. And in these cases, the experimentation kind of failing some of the time or uh, the motivation, these are really leading a uh, success, right? Because the system is well established. But in other cases, um, still, I think you need to design the system well, but then employees have some incentive to try out new ideas. And maybe the employees can trust the leaders, right? There would be some trust, um, mutual trust and a better communication. And in this regard, I think the experimentation, like most individual level outcomes could lead a better outcomes. And one reason is of course, employees, no citizens, right? They can interact with them. They can identify the problems that citizens are facing. Top leaders, maybe the top level like government officials may not really understand the local context. So in this regard, I think the local context is very important. And also after building the system well, uh, encouraging employees to bring more ideas and kind of trusting them, more empowerment can lead a positive impact. But it's a big question to answer like, in a very in a few minutes. So thank you very much for the excellent question. Brilliant. Okay. No, I mean that's very that clarifies and also I think that addresses one of the questions in the Q and A, which says, um, from experience, how difficult is it to integrate innovative thinking into local government culture? Um, so I mean, you were talking about that really. I, I guess I mean I, I, a sort of a related question would be the question. I mean, that we have these things like the Global Innovation Index. Yes. Um, which is very private sector oriented. And I mean, there's an ideological component there because the ideological component is simple, that the center of innovation, the locus of innovation is private firms and it doesn't happen in the government sector. And so when you see diagrams of the national system of innovation in the middle, you know, in the, with a star around it is always firm level innovation. No one ever talks about public sector innovation. So, I mean, the, why is it not possible maybe to develop something like a public sector innovation index um, and use that as a comparative basis and also to identify exactly that question, you know, from experience, which, which local authorities are able to successfully integrate innovation into um, sort of local government culture, if you like. Um, uh, so that might be one way of doing that. Yeah. Yeah, it's an excellent question. And honestly, so my co-author, Kohei Suzuki, so he's at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And we published one piece using this GIA, kind of Global Innovation Index. 
But the main problem for this one is it's a private sector or firm focused. And in fact, there is a big issue that you cannot really compare like the effectiveness of public service or innovativeness of entrepreneurship of the public organizations. So there is a big need here. And hopefully maybe in South African case, at least they can maybe compare cities across each other, right? Then it will maybe give a guidance maybe for uh, maybe a good example for uh, other municipal governments as well. I think the starting point that hopefully that should be a starting point that um, the leaders maybe sit in the city level or government level, they can try to identify like how to increase innovation at the public sector level, not the private, but in terms of bureaucracy, how they operate in terms of the climate of organization. I think there is a big need in this case. So. Okay, brilliant. No, nice. It's a, it'd be interesting to see. So I, I think we've got, uh, where's the 12.05, 12.06 now. So we've kind of run out of time. I see that on the, on the questions and answers, David Kutsia has, is continuing the discussion really about this tension between compliance and entrepreneurial activity. Um, and I think let's leave that in the background for the moment. I, you know, there are ways of managing that and that's what you've indicated. And, and I'm sure that this is a question which will be addressed in the later discussions. So at this stage, I think I would like to say thank you very much, Mehmet. I really apologize. I should have known it was Turkey um, because <laughs> I, it would have been easy just to Google it and find it. <laughs> um, but I was, that was what I was told and I didn't check it. Yeah. So in any case, so, that was a, it was a no, mistake. I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed uh, about that. <laughs> no, no, please do not worry. So um, actually, if you look at the Turkey, most of the like people immigrated from other places or like there are locals that historically like a hundred thousand years ago. And my DNA shows that actually 30% of my DNA is Italian. Oh, wow. I don't know where it comes. So yeah, I think good guess because it is more than like Asian genes. Uh, there, did we, uh, there we go. How did we know? <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. You. But in any case, thank you very much. That was great. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll be able to participate in the discussions during the day. But if you're not, then of course we understand. So thank you. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. So, so at this point, let me now go to our next speaker. Um, so I just must pull up the information. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Film Dwacher, who's going to be talking, giving us a keynote address. Um, so uh, Phil, it's a great pleasure to have you on this uh, platform attending this seminar. Um, I'll very briefly give some background. You have a BSc, MSc and PhD from University of Witwatersrand and your academic career includes serving as a professor of science and technology policy at the University of Pretoria and physics lectureships at the Advits. Um, so it's uh, Advits, sorry, South, University of South Africa and Fort Hare. Um, we all know you very well as the DG of the Department of Science and Innovation, despite what the video told us about Department of Science and Technology, um, but formerly the director in the Department of Arts, Culture, Science and Technology, and you serve on NACI. You are a celebrity within the science and technology community, and I don't think I need to give much more introduction. I still have copies, by the way, of the South African Technology Foresight Project outputs um, in my office at the University of Pretoria, which is very ill-frequented right now. Hopefully one day we'll get back to the stage where I can go back into the office regularly. Um, but uh, Phil, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Hopefully you are there. I haven't looked to see whether you are in attendance. Um, Phil, ah, Phil, you here. Brilliant. Um, so, Phil, over to you. Um, you're giving us the keynote address. I have no idea what it's about, and that's what you're going to be telling us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Dave. Um, I'm not sure what keynote address means. Um, uh, the team asked me to say a few words to contextualize, I think, uh, what this uh, meeting is all about. So I'll probably make three points. Uh, and I followed the discussions uh, before uh, you allowed me to say a few words now. Phil, just quickly, sorry, just to interrupt you quickly. Um, you're quite 
the sound is quite low. Um, I don't know whether you could uh, move the computer closer to you or I don't know what, uh, otherwise we just almost turn up our sound on our systems. Let's see. All right. Uh, is that better? Um, on the full... Yeah, it's, it's a bit better. Yeah, that's, that's okay. better. So um, I know you don't like shouting. So <laughs> no, no, that's fine, Dave. I was just saying thank you very much for the kind introduction. And that I will probably give three points uh, in relation to providing context for this discussion that you're having. And also trying to clarify that my team did not uh, tell me that I'm doing a keynote uh, and I'm still figuring out uh, after all these years in government what a keynote means. Um, but I'll say a few words. Uh, say so the first point is, why are we doing this as a Department of Science and Innovation? And you would probably know that maybe South Africans, but those who are not South Africans, that our 2030 National Development Vision describe a capable state as being the one that is able to achieve national priorities of economic transformation, inclusive growth, and efficient public service delivery through good public management and the introduction of innovation and technology to improve the capability of the state. So we are deriving what we're doing as a Department of Science and, and, and Innovation, therefore, from this uh, NDP target. As again, uh, most of the South Africans know, we have subsequently uh, started to develop an implementation plan, uh, which we call a Decadle plan uh, for this uh, white paper. And what the Decadle plan identifies is the use of innovation to achieve a capable state as an area of focus in the next 10 years. Our interpretation is that a capable state is both developmental and transformative. Good financial management, evidence-based policy and decision-making processes, management support for innovation in the public sector, in our view, are all prerequisites for an, for an efficient and effective municipal enterprise. A local government sector that performs well, supported by technology, systems, data, and innovations investments will help improve governance, to build um, as, uh, confidence in the citizenry, enhance the quality of basic services that people provide, uh, reduce poverty, and will also help in combating uh, corruption. That's very, very important. So in line, therefore, with the white paper policy intent of positioning government as an enabler of innovation and the policy intent that says we need to ensure a whole of government approach to innovation, we as a Department of Science and Innovation appointed the South African Local Government Association, popularly known as SALGA, uh, as well as the Human Sciences Research Council and the University of KwaZulu-Natal to develop, pilot, and roll out the Municipal Innovation Maturity Index, MIMI, in municipalities in order to encourage the adoption and uptake of innovation in municipalities. I would uh, assume that you have already been introduced to what uh, the uh, Municipal Innovation Maturity Index is, but I think it's an index in our view that measures the capabilities of individual employees and municipalities to learn, implement, adopt, and institutionalize innovations that can improve the delivery of services. And what the tool does is it benchmarks and assesses science, technology, and innovation readiness levels of the municipalities and determines innovation maturity level. I can give you the history of where this work comes from, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to do that, except to indicate to you that uh, this tool was piloted by the project team. And in the pilot phase, the project team recruited 24 municipalities, nine metros, nine district municipalities, and six local munici municipalities uh, to participate in this endeavor. However, a total of only 68 municipalities were initially targeted to participate in the pilot the implementation testing of the MIMI, but due to, of course, the conditions that we all know, 
we were only able uh, to get a few of them uh, to participate in this uh, pilot. I suspect that uh, as part of your program, Dave, uh, the participants will get an opportunity uh, to be given the results of this pilot that uh, we conducted as the Department uh, of Science and Innovation. What I do want to leave you as key messages uh, is I appreciate and would like to have the ongoing partnership as a department with SALGA, South African Local Government uh, Association, University of KwaZulu-Natal and Human Sciences Research Councils uh, on the rollout of this pilot. The second message is that as a Department of Science and Innovation, we are working very, very hard to set up a governance structure within government, which is an interministerial committee of a number of government departments who we believe needs to start uh, taking innovation to improve, whether it's their service delivery or whether to modernize their sectors or to adopt new sources of growth. And we think that the work and the discussions that you're having here today will be taken in those discussions which will be happening early in September around institutionalizing within the local government department and traditional affairs, as well as other government departments to begin to think about how to institutionalize uh, innovation within the public sector. I also would like to invite municipalities to partner with the department in the re national rollout of this uh, Municipal Innovation Maturity Index. And also importantly, to encourage their participation in our programs as a department that are designed to support municipalities to scale up innovations that can deliver um, services and improve on services. These programs are not only funded by ourselves, but they are also funded um, by uh, international partners. Uh, we have a very uh, useful and a successful program which uh, we have with the European Union and of course the National Treasury. And as a Department of Science and Innovation, we are piloting something which we call a Technology Acquisition and Deployment Fund, TADF, which is a call that is initially being uh, implemented at the Technology Innovation Agency, one of the agencies that report to the Minister of Science and Innovation, where innovators or private sector firms, NGOs, or even public institutions that have innovations that they believe could assist government in introducing innovation or municipalities to intro introduce innovation for public service delivery are funded and we pilot these. And then we look at means and ways of getting those innovations uh, into the private sector. We also think and believe that the new district development model, uh, which has been proposed as a new way of government working together provides an excellent approach to introduce innovations and technologies that can renew existing economic sectors, drive new sources of growth, and create a capable public sector that is driven and supported by technology and innovation to improve the standard of living and the quality of basic services. We have started to draw a range of activities from the National System of Innovation that over the years we have been funding and how they can help the citizens through this district development model to, to have better life uh, through innovations that we have funded. Just to give you one example, it is very interesting that if you think about broadband and the services that communities in rural areas do not have, but if you look at some innovations that have been uh, done by the public sector, such as TV white spaces at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, and a new model of providing broadband in rural areas, which was developed uh, by the University of the Western Cape are becoming excellent models of how you can not only provide broadband, but you can drive new social entrepreneurs in rural areas in order to ensure that there is better service delivery and improvement in the quality of life. But I'd also like to invite all of the participants to work with us as a Department of Science and Technology in uh, rolling out the development, uh, sorry, the Decadal Plan, and in particular, how to drive innovations to support 
a capable state and also creating an enabling environment for innovation across the state and in municipalities in particular. So with those few words, thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Dave. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the question that you did raise about the participants being given the opportunity to see the results of the pilot program and this um, initial report. Um, I think we must ask Andrew to address that. So, Doctor, or maybe what the Dr. Peter Jacobs or Dr. Andrew Ockham, um, and they're going to be talking later, so we probably just park that issue for the moment. But I think that's absolutely essential, you know, that everyone gets access to those documents. But thank you, that was that was great. It was I really enjoyed the three points, um, you know, why are we doing this, and then the and this issue about institutionalization. And certainly you don't need to persuade me about universal broadband and access. I think that's such a brilliant example. You know, the, the, you know, I think universal free broadband access is what we should have, but of course, you know, this is um, a difficult target to achieve within a developing country. Um, I, I think, um, Phil, that there is a question and answer session after the next uh, segment, which is number seven on the messages of support. So um, I'm not sure if you're going to have the time to hang around for that. Um, there might well be some questions for you, but if you do, it's another 10 minutes or so, that'd be fantastic. Otherwise, um, but thank you so much. That was really interesting and valuable. Um, and there are a number of questions that have arisen. So I'm going to move on um, just to the next session so we can keep to our program. Um, and the next session then is, as I said, messages of support from the Mimi partners. Um, and we have one uh, person who's not going to be talking. So Dr. Udesh Pillay isn't going to be addressing the forum, but we hopefully have uh, Professor Moshabela and Professor Simbai. Um, and I, I haven't looked to see, but um, Mosa, are you there, Mosa? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here, dude. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Do you know that we met, I don't know how many years ago, before the beginning of history, um, when we worked <laughs> on that, uh, it was a brochure for healers. the treatment of mm. HIV AIDS, and you were writing the section about the integration of traditional medicine into Sorry. the treatment. So I don't have, I've looked, um, the bio list doesn't give us any detail about you. I know that you are the acting deputy vice chancellor of research at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Um, exactly. So since we last spoke, you have certainly moved up in the world. Um, congratulations. <laughs> I'm not sure, uh, DVC research is a lovely position. So um, you, you're going to, uh, you're going to enjoy that. Um, but in any case, I, I just um, would, yeah, I think uh, without wasting any more time, let me ask you for your message of support to Mimi. Absolutely. And and I, I like that uh, you call it Mimi because I'm more comfortable with calling it Mimi. I'm more familiar with the name Mimi uh, instead of I, my, I, my. I would triple for myself saying that. But let me thank you, Dave, and also uh, greet everyone who's present, um, all the panelists and all the attendees. And, and also to thank um, the, the, the DG, uh, Dr. Phil Muchacha, and uh, the, everyone involved at DSI in terms of the, the leadership of bringing together all of the partners that were involved in, in leading this work. And uh, certainly it sounds like there is quite a history to it that I'm very curious to actually track and, and understand uh, as we engage further. But, uh, you know, it's wonderful to see the progress that has been made up to this point, to this place that we are at in terms of launching and, and the national rollout. I, I want to also thank um, the, the, the colleagues at uh, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the School of Build, and, uh, Build Environment and uh, Development Studies, who have been engaging actively in this work. And, uh, and, and really congratulate you for a, for a wonderful work done. Um, I, 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 I want to speak briefly in response largely to, to the DG for, for, for your point, for request of, of support in rolling out this work. And 
And I want to give context to why I think for us as uh, the University of KwaZulu Natal and really the province of, 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 of KwaZulu Natal, why this is so important for us to support. We, 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 have, we are, we're finding ourselves um, having to consider ourselves as a university a lot more along the lines of becoming an entrepreneurial university. We've got pockets of entrepreneurship um, and, and a lot of innovation happens there, but it's at such a small scale that it does not necessarily have a huge impact in the city uh, and also in, in the province. And we still have a problem whereby a lot of our graduates um, do not always get employed after that and after they graduate. And there is a call for the university to really look critically at itself in terms of how it engages with this notion of innovation. Yes, we do research. Yes, we get um, a lot of recognition and credit for the research that we do as an, as, as an institution. But for a lot of the inventors that we have in the university, they tend to not necessarily get the kind of uh, recognition and rewards that people who are actively involved in the standard research uh, kind of uh, structures and funding streams tend to enjoy. And so we've been really talking a lot about this and part of my task as uh, DVC research is to really take this issue forward. And uh, I'm very excited to also let you know, DG, to put you at ease that there is a commitment from across the leadership in the university, especially drop of COVID-19, where we had to assess the value chain for vaccine manufacturing and we found ourselves coming short. There is a, a renewed commitment to innovation as a whole and making sure that the value chains are supported. Uh, more recently, in, in, in the wake of the civil unrest that we've had in the province, there is a lot more call for us to integrate better in our communities, integrate better in the city, uh, the metros and the municipalities in order to make sure that we are a university that is embedded. And so those are for me, I think enough to, to reassure you that there is a, lot, a bigger agenda here around innovation. Um, and there are specific activities that we are really working at, including science and innovation park that we're working with DSI and CSIR to try and, and, and bring to, to the university. But we're looking at a bigger plan for, for, the, for the whole city and really a, a hub and spoke kind of format for, for, the, for the province in terms of innovation. So I, I'm really going to be knocking on your door, DG, and the partners involved to ensure that we can, we can take this work forward. We have our full support as a consortium and we're really looking forward to support the rollout. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mosa. Um, I'm sure the DG will be very reassured by those messages. Um, so now I, I just, I want to give the floor to Professor Simbai. And again, I don't have any bio details for Professor Simbai. Um, and I also don't have any anecdotes. He's one of the few people on the program that I've never met. Um, so I can't tell you that we met before history, but uh, Professor Simbai, are you there? If I just- Yes, um, yes I am. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, yeah. I, I have met many of the previous CEOs of the Human Sciences Research Council, including Olive Shasana, um, and, um, but not yourself. So I, I apologize, I have no bias other than that you are the acting CEO of the HSRC, which is one of our biggest science councils and certainly the biggest human science research council. So over to you. Yep, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Master of Ceremonies. Uh, the Director General, Dr. Phil Mkaya, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, good day to uh, you all. Uh, as with Professor Moshavera, I would like to thank the Department of Science and Innovation for their support, uh, the support which they have given to the HSRC uh, together with its partners on this project, uh, which they have been, they developed and piloted uh, 
since 2015. Um, it is gratifying to hear about this excellent example, how the HSSC works with uh, DSI as part of the national system of innovation as a key partner and its commitment as the National Science Council with others uh, as our mandate includes working closely uh, with the rest of the national system of innovation, especially with universities like uh, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, uh, as well as SAGA, with the goal of providing evidence-based policy support for government. Indeed, this is in line with two of our own five strategic outcomes, namely uh, our second strategic outcome is to develop a consolidated relationship of trust and influence with government to help guide and inform policy. And our third strategic outcome is uh, to be recognized as a trusted and engaged research partner with scientific communities and civil society. At the HSRC, as with other science councils under the DSI stable, we do pride ourselves with our role in promoting innovation across various areas, such as service delivery uh, innovations. Indeed, with strong support from DSI over the years, the same team uh, that has been working on MIMI uh, and under the leadership of Dr. Peter Jacobs, have done, uh, also successfully done a number of similar research projects. I'll mention a couple in passing. For example, what is termed the Innovation Partnership for Rural Development Program. Um, that project uh, involved customizing a monitoring and evaluation framework to strengthen technology and innovation capabilities and learning within the targeted marginalized rural districts. Um, second project uh, was uh, known as Local Innovation Advancement Tools or LEAD for short. Uh, its main aim was to enhance the contribution of science and technology interventions to rural development, to deepen understanding of the social and institutional dynamics of rural innovations, and to inform the work of the multi-stakeholder rural innovation partnership. Uh, therefore, the MIMI project uh, is actually a continuation of this tradition. Uh, finally, the MIMI project shows the main advantages of collaborating closely in applied research with government and other partners, and thereby shortening the process of converting research evidence into policy and practice, which as we all know at times, uh, takes quite a long time or even never. Uh, apart from the additional financial support which uh, DSI provided, the, the fact that there is joint identification of key policy issues and development of uh, interventions facilitates this process uh, of converting uh, the research evidence that is obtained into both policy and finally to implement it uh, as a practice. Uh, we therefore look forward for, uh, to continuing working closely with DSI and indeed with the other partners, as well as other government departments on such in initiatives. Uh, thank you very much, Master of Ceremonies. Thank you so much, Professor Sambaye. Um, that was 
Great for our program. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to move on to the questions and answers. And uh, I, so the, there's one very big question. Phil, I would love to give this to Dr. Mundracha, but I think, Phil, it's probably been answered really in the introductory sections, inter, introductory sections to the white paper. So the question is, what are the real constraints of transformational innovative solutions for our economy? Um, in order to nurture challenge, for the um, nurturing of talent as quality of life and bridge the gap between public, private and technocrats. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Phil, would you like to have a go at that question? Dave, um, we, you know, having spent some time in government, you, you suddenly realize that um, sometimes you need to spend a bit more time being an evangelist, so to speak. Because things that you think are fairly simple and straightforward in other sectors, uh, they are not easy in government. The first issue relates to the point that I think you had with the professor that was speaking before you. You have an organization or a public sector or even society that sometimes doesn't value its own innovations. I don't know if, you, if you've realized that in South Africa. Um, so there is a big cultural problem that we have to address as, as, as a society that wants to drive and thrive from innovations. Uh, I, I'm guilty as such as well. I remember um, somebody telling me about the innovations that you see on our beaches. You know, the cross concrete uh, um, that you see on the beaches, especially around uh, um, the Tlabeja. Yeah, uh, the doll also. The yeah, doll also they, they're called. Yeah. Exactly. I yeah. didn't know that this is something you don't find in any part of the world. It was started in South Africa. Uh, I'm just giving you one example and, and there yeah. are many, many, yeah. many others. So the first thing that we, we want to try and do as a Department of Science and Innovation, hopefully working with yourselves, is that we should value our own innovations. And in valuing our own innovations, the point that was raised in the public service, and I suspect in the private sector, you then need not to fear introducing new innovations. Uh, there was a question around in a culture of an organization that wants to get on with the bottom line. Where, where do you place people who come with these innovative ideas? And I've got an answer for you and, and the team. And it comes from our president. And this is something that I think as a South African community, we should uh, use in the time that he's the president. He says he was a chairman of one of the boards of the telcos. Uh, and one time he met an employee um, during the coffee break and he asked the employee, what is your job? This person says, I don't have a job description. And the answer was, why not? He says, no, 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 my job is to go to all the units in the telco and look at what they do. Sometimes I come to work, sometimes I don't come to work. And the president says, you get paid for this? And he said, yes, I, I get paid for this. But it was basically the person who would then come back and say, this is how you can optimize your business uh, processes within this unit. So I think uh, the second thing that then we need to think about over and above our culture is to create the space for those people who have innovations to do so. And thirdly, we should then design our public procurement. Now I'm talking about the public sector. We can't find ourselves in a situation where we have the procurement that says go out and attend and get uh, innovations that are coming X, Y, and Z in the world and not being able to encourage your own innovations. You would know, and I'm sure the bulk of the people here will know that a number of countries have developed their innovation capabilities by using public procurement as part of then embracing innovation in the Republic of Korea they use this strategy very successfully to build their nuclear energy export program. So I can't exhaust everything, but I hope that these three 
just start to give a sense of uh, some of the things that we need to worry about. There are many, many, many others. And in the decadal plan, when we publish it, you will see there's a chapter that's dedicated on this. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think this, I'm not sure who can answer this other question, but it's really about the integration of this initiative with two other programs in government or centers. I mean, the one is the Center for Public Service Innovation Programs, and then the other is SESTI in the HSRC. So, I mean, maybe I should go back to, um, to, to Tsipang at this point and just ask Tsipang to explain to all of the delegates how this, how MIMI links to the Center for Public Service Innovation and also SESTI and, and I guess also NACI who are very involved in this space. So how do you, how are you going to achieve that synergy and integration between these four kind of programs within government? Okay, no, thank you very much, uh, Professor. I, I think the context is in the science technology white paper. So we need to be working across a number of institutions, including knowledge generating institutions, but also the likes of SALGAS, uh, CST, they are doing indicators, but also how, how do we bring all of these institutions together? Uh, the DG had a meeting with CPSI yesterday, uh, discussing again the role of CPSI uh, broadly in the national system of innovation. So we acknowledge that when uh, the tool matures, we may be looking at working with SESTI, but we may also be looking at uh, supporting similar initiatives of measuring innovation in the public sector, working with CPSI. So the tool that is being presented today has just been a tool for municipalities, but what will be an equivalent of this uh, and uh, what sorts of partnerships do we need? But I think the spirit and the objective and the policy intents in the white paper are about a whole of government approach, but uh, 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 what you call, in ensuring that government and, and entities uh, an enab enabler to innovation. So my reply will be exactly that, uh, uh, Prof, that we, we will be looking at working with CPSI and other institutions. Uh, okay, thanks. Least. Thank you so much. I mean, I think that that's going to reassure many of the delegates who, you know, might be wondering how this is going to work out with multiple parties really involved in this innovation index space. All right, um, I'm, not, I'm going to move on. Um, as I said, we've got a tight program. There's lots of interesting uh, presentations still to come. So I want to move to the next one, which is topic nine on the agenda. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you when I find the information. Um, I'm going to introduce to you Mr. Sianda and Kathleen from the Department of Cooperative Governance where he is a manager of municipal institutional establishment. Um, Sianda has a BA from UNISA, Masters in Development Studies from University of Free State and a CPMD from the University of Witz. Um, and he's currently the manager of the institutional establishment in the Department of Cooperative Governance. Um, formerly, he was a municipal manager in Ut Utugela Utukela um, District Municipality and also a Corporate Services Director in that same municipality. So Sianda has uh, a lot of experience both at in national government departments and also in local authorities. Um, we look forward then to your presentation. You're going to be talking to us about a subject which we have already um, mentioned very briefly and that would be um, uh, broadband infrastructure and digital development. So your topic is South Africa's city um, digital development, a perspective of smart city framework, vision, strategy, challenges, and expectations. Okay. Okay, if you give me five minutes, I'll try and round it in 10 minutes because it's too short. If you can uh, move to the next, I'm presenting the South African smart cities framework. If you can move to the next slide. Uh, what I'll be dealing with here, I'll just give a bit of a background, then I'll just get into the content of the Smart Cities Framework, which will deal with the topics as you can see there, 
will touch on the introduction in the background, South African context, South African interpretation of smart cities. And what is more important here, we should already deal with are factors that should inform the planning and implementation of the smart city initiative, smart city intervention and conclusion. If you can move to the next slide. And now as a background, as you all know that it all came up from the sauna, whereby the president came up with a, a dream of having a smart city as a, in the country. And then we that provoked the discussion around the smart cities within the South African context. What is important here is that we should understand that the way we define smart city within the South African context is that it defines investment in human social capital that takes place, tradition and modern communication infrastructure that fuel economic development, a better quality of life is provided, and that there's a prudent management of national resources. The, this has been dealt with uh, in collaboration with uh, CSS are in developing the smart city framework. And uh, what is very important here is that nothing that the framework is merely a conceptual framework structure. We should note that. And that is just intended to share learning of smart cities and perceived limitations. And also, it outlines a set of principles and critical issues to guide the decision making of smart cities, as well as preconditions and enablers when initiating smart cities. Next slide. Okay, can I have next slide, please? In the next slide, if you look at the content of the smart cities framework, is that the purpose of it is just to guide decision making. So it's very important to understand that the smart city framework is not instructive and does not provide specifications, nor prescribe norms and standards. But the objective of the SCF is actually to encourage local and international learning and also highlight South African realities that need to be considered. Also is aimed at assisting in developing a common understanding on the concept of smart city and outline a set of principles to provide guidance when decisions have to be made regarding identification, planning, implementation of smart city initiative and technologies. Finally, the factors to consider and the steps to be taken when identifying uh, and implementing smart city initiative. Next, please. So what you see there is just unpacking really the, between the city and smart. The smart here is generally associated with ICT and also with the fourth industrial revolution. And in addition to this technology intensive interpretation, smart could also mean intelligent and knowledge intensive. The understanding of the term technology could be expanded to also include innovative approaches, techniques, and processes. And also, if you look at the city, in this context, the city has got multiple meanings. An all catch up phrase that includes various types of settlements within the South African context. So it can, if we say smart city, we also refer to cities, towns, villages of any size. It can even include municipalities, district locals, and custom built greenfield uh, cities, large new precincts development, upgrading and retrofitting aspects, as well as new residential or commercial or mixed use development, privately developed gated communities. That's how we should understand the smart city within South African context. Can we have the next, uh, next slide, please? So in other words, we just looked at a slightly background of how the smart city originated. We said it originated in the 1990s, and it was merely looking at e-governance and high-tech industries to encourage growth. Research identified three dominant discourses, which is infrastructure-based services that using ICTs, urban development, creating conditions conducive to business development, and social inclusion, learning, and development are central to better meeting community needs. Smart city has got these promises, really, or opportunities, if we look at within South African context. It should be more effective, data-driven decision-making, reduced environmental footprint or impact, new economic development opportunities, improved quality of life, safer communities, enhanced engagement 
between municipalities and residents and should be cost saving. Next slide, please. This, there are also though smart city concerns when we come up with smart city initiative. The one concern is that interventions cannot, may happen that are not appropriate to the context. So we should note of that. And also that maybe there might be vested corporate interest when people are looking at smart cities, which we should safeguard against. Technology should not be looked at uh, as an enabler, but it should be looked at as a starting point towards coming with smart cities. And we should have understanding of defining a city, like what I've just explained earlier on. And also we should take ethical contents into perspective when we deal with uh, smart cities. Within the South African context is that the smart city should make a meaningful contribution to improving the quality of life of citizens as smart initiative should be key problems addressing key problems faced by South African cities and towns. And we are saying within South African context, for smart cities to be successful, it must take into consideration social economic characteristics, that is poverty, inequality, and employment, the niche of South African cities, looking into apartheid spatial planning, municipalities' realities, that is the functionality, political stability, corruption, and competence within the municipality. The, 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 the municipality, regulatory environment, like we are looking at all those international imperatives and also national policies like NDP and so on. Smart city policies, guidelines, initiative also should be taken to framework about what is we move to the next slide. Okay, what you see there uh, is that I spoke about the six interdependent principles that you should take into consideration when we have to initiate smart uh, uh, cities initiative. You know, the most important slide here is that we are looking into the six dependent interdependent variables. Is that first of all, the smart city should be smart for all, which means that it should not be at the expense of the society. And they should use technology as an enabler, which means that technology should make citizens' lives better. It must be shaped and response to local context, which means that an ideal smart city should not drive the planning or implementation of smart cities and is informed by the real needs of the community. So it's, that one is self-explanatory and embraces innovation, like we said, partnerships and cooperation, that it should incorporate a collective several projects, initiatives, and it must be sustainable and resilient and safe. Next uh, slide, please. So what is important here is that these are the factors that should inform planning and implementation of smart cities. The nature and purpose of smart cities is that there should be thorough understanding of the nature and purpose of the smart city and that it should be dealing with alignment of smart city initiative with existing planning and operations. So it should definitely depend on alignment and share smart city experiences that this initiative should be there to enhance learning from peers. Next slide, please. This is just a diagram that puts together those pre principles into a very comprehensive uh, structure of how we should look into uh, these principles mangled within the Smart City Initiative. Can we move to the next slide? So if we really have to deal with the smart cities, we need to answer a certain, certain questions that are the people living in our city or town satisfied with the services? That's the first question. If not, Improving the delivery of presentation should be the first priority rather than thinking differently. Secondly, is to say, how can the city become smarter? So in other words, how can it become uh, effective and efficient in the delivery of services? That's what we should be looking into when we deal with innovation or motivating for smarter city initiative. Next, please. 
So there are preconditions that we should be dealing with when we assessing the smart readiness. First step is to assess if whether the municipality and the current situation of the understanding is able ability to provide services under these conditions. The intention is to establish whether there's a strong foundation to build a smart city initiative or phrase differently, whether there are there persons within that municipality to do conduct smart cities. Secondly, we should assess where the municipality could improve its ability to provide services. And this means that if the municipality should be able to have the ability or can acquire certain abilities to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the delivery of services. Next slide, please. I'm almost there though. So the preconditions here are just being made so simpler in the table, whereby we can preconditions for becoming smarter. That basically, if I summarize it, you look at institutional and organizational arrangements within the municipality. We look at existing infrastructure, capabilities, capacity of government officials and communities, and then we come up with enablers for implementing it, which is a smart city plan, digital infrastructure, the skills there to, pro to provide that uh, initiative, the partnerships that can be forged to get that done, and the community involvement, so that that could be an all encompassing uh, uh, framework to support the betterment of the people. The next slide. Next slide. In conclusion, I want to say, uh, Prof, uh, municipalities will require to be supported by DCOP provinces and SALGA and other national de departments in the assistance with assessments to establish the smart readiness. So in other words, this is everybody's business. Although everything is happening at the municipal space, in fact, all delivery is happening at the municipal space. So we need to make sure that we support those initiatives, even when we do our innovations within municipalities on what we're mandated to do, but we should be assisting municipalities and their space to assess the establishment. Secondly, the capacity building program to empower local government officials and councillors and other role players would also be of value to ensure that appropriate inclusive smart city initiative implementation and in addition a platform needs to be provided for the sharing smart city learning amongst the players. We need to imbue our planning processes with a set of principles and values upon which we build solidarity, commitment and unity. The smart city framework outlines a set of principles that should support the ideals and could be used to measure our quality progress in creative, inclusive smart cities. Last slide, please. The last slide, please. So it is within this context that we recommend that whatever we do in South Africa, we all support this smart city initiative, which is advancements in terms of how we should improve in the delivery of services to our, our communities. Thank you, Prof. Thank you ever so much, Sianda. And we kind of run out of the time for the question and answer, which is a bit of a shame because um, there's far from a silicon silence, we have a silicon avalanche. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, Sianda, if you don't mind spending a little bit of time online and answering some of these questions um, on, on the site under the Q&A. Um, but very briefly, let me ask you one of them. It's hard to know which one of these would be the most significant or relevant to our discussion. Um, there are lots of interesting questions here about, for instance, um, are you aware of the smart city framework developed by the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies? And why do we have a dual strategy? Um, but I, I think the, just a, I mean, there are two questions which are linked really, which is, and the one is this, you know, can we as a country really afford um, a smart city intervention or program at this stage when there are so many other challenges at local government level? Um, but the question from Mr. Reddy, I think, or Ms. Ms. Reddy, have any of our cities graduated to a smart city as yet? 
and what are some of the challenges. So maybe very briefly, because we have run out of time, Sianda, if you do you have any thoughts on that? Have any of our cities graduated um, to smart city status? Okay, uh, maybe let me just answer about the first question about are we aware of our initiative? When the smart city was developed, it was developed in collaboration with all other stakeholders who are involved in uh, a framework with uh, contributions coming from various departments. We are also involved as well as municipalities. We don't have to up the framework and call it. But what I can say is that we are fully aware it's not a duplication. It also encompasses all other initiatives that have been in existence. About the municipalities, if whether within this context, can they do it? I think when I made a presentation on smart city, I spoke about the smart city readiness and how we should assess whether a municipality is ready on, on, on to, to, for a smart city. That is actually explaining that we need to start there as a process. If you read the whole smart city document, it outlines the processes that we need to follow to do assessment for the smart readiness. Or not all municipalities will be at the same level of smart readiness. They'll be smart on certain areas and not smart on others. So that's why we have to do assessments. I'm not sure that I've responded well, uh, Prof. Okay, that's fine. That's great. Thank you. And if you get a chance, just have a look at the remaining questions and see if you can give some answers there. Um, otherwise, I'm so. sure we could follow up after this. Um, the, so now I'm going to keep pressing on. Um, so the, I'm going to go to the uh, presentations then, which relate in more detail to Mimi, the survey instrument to the implementation report and the lessons learned. Um, and I think uh, I see Dr. Peter Jacobs is here and he's already switched on his video. So um, we look forward to your presentation. Let me just um, very briefly give an intro. Um, if you can also make sure then you address this issue about whether the delegates will have access to the implementation report um, and some of the material that's going to be presented, the structure of the index, etc. Um, so Dr. Peter Jacobs is a strategic lead researcher at the HSRC, has a PhD in economics and is a C1 researcher rated by the NRF. He concentrates on the economics of agrarian change and socioeconomic transitions, including the socioeconomic dynamics of innovation. Um, he has a research experience spanning roughly two decades and continues to lead large multi-year projects um, on a range of questions about innovation value chains and the benefits of innovation for, to, for poor people. Since 2015, he has helped to develop the scientific and methodological foundations of MIMI and demonstrates how it benefits, benefits municipal innovation activities. So I think um, Dr. Jacobs, over to you. Uh, I mean, the core, this is the core of what we are about today. So MIMI and how it's going to impact and benefit. So we really do look forward to what you have to say um, and the connection with the previous material. Thank you. Yeah, good, uh, good morning, uh, Professor Valvain and all the participants. Uh, I have a screen to share just to keep my input focused and it should be seen as an integrated component of all the other uh, presentations on, uh, digital, on, on the Municipal Innovation Maturity Index. So I just hope everybody will be able to see my screen and I'll go on to the full presentation mode uh, so that uh, we, we have everybody there. So my focus is going to be just to lay out very briefly uh, what the Municipal Innovation Maturity Index instrument uh, is all about. And it's really about the, the science behind, behind, the, the, behind it all. And some of these will, of course, now be familiar with a lot of the participants because they are linked to, to what uh, uh, Meme presented earlier on when he, when he spoke, uh, what the, the DG said, and what uh, uh, many, many others have, have indicated already. So I'm just going to sort of drill down a little bit into the details and the specificities of, uh, of the instrument. I'd love to start out by uh, just uh, answering one or two of the issues uh, straight away on the CPSI 
This uh, work engaged with CPSI at two levels, both organizationally, uh, which means that we've reached out and interacted with the CPSI, as well as all the platforms and uh, especially their award framework and instruments that they've developed. But secondly, we have also incorporated uh, delegates from the CPSI on our reference team and our reference group. And CPSI therefore uh, be became integral to, you know, advising us on how uh, we, we sort of should be developing th this particular platform. So focusing on the science, my uh, presentation is basically one slide, but I'm going to try and break the slide up uh, for, for the uh, benefit of the delegates and participants here into five uh, uh, main bullet points. Firstly, is to just showcase the history of MIMI. In other words, its so-called construction timeline. Then to focus on the facets of the interactive platform. Then how MIMI is actually an action-oriented information and decision tool. In other words, how can the instrument be utilized then to sort of drill down into one of the examples to illustrate how the innovation maturity index system actually works because there were quite a few questions in the Q&A and in the chat box about how this model and framework links to a whole host of other models. Now we, behind all the scientific stuff, we've got quite a few concept papers and scientific publications and articles and policy briefs out that uh, uh, should be accessible to everybody, uh, especially via the MIMI uh, a website that is being uh, being uh, developed. And then, of course, my last slide, or the only slide really is the slide about the future, because this is the, the national rollout launch, but I'm not going to take up the time of uh, Pro uh, Professor uh, Mieni, who is going to, 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 you know, talk in greater detail about the national rollout process going into the future. So really the timeline can be summarized into this, this little simple diagram on the kind of raindrop there and then the cloud. We, we today we're talking about digital MIMI, which is a digital platform that can enable municipal officials really to engage with uh, the the underlying instrument. So the phase first, the first phase started with a with a kind of drop there in the in the one corner in the bottom uh, left hand corner. Started with uh, around 2015 and 2017, and that was the first phase to really do the building blocks or the the basic foundational work. Uh, of, of MIMI and this uh, was a part of the learning that MIMI uh, sort of detailed uh, in, in a, a very large body of work internationally on municipal innovation or um, uh, innovation in the public sector more, more broadly and more in, from 2019 onwards we really start with phase two which I prefer to call the digital phase which is really about providing a digital platform that enable uh, that will enable easier access by municipal officials, the, the final end users of the platform to engage with it and make, and make use of it. And so that of course doesn't explain really, so what is uh, MIMI all about? To basically understand that, you've got to understand the notion of what we call an inter, uh, a platform with interacting facets. Now this, uh, uh, what I call ice cream diagram, uh, is, is basically explained by means of going through each and every one of the steps to understand the different facets. Each one of those bubbles, ice cream bubbles, represents actually one of the facets that's kind of fundamental to an understanding of the Municipal Innovation Maturity Index. So where do we start? We start with the blue bubble in the center at the top, which is the Innovation Maturity Framework. And that is really essential to grasp all these other models the colleagues have been uh, talking about earlier on in the Q&A and also in responses to uh, the earlier presentation on learning from, from international experiences. Now this in itself, we've written quite a lot on, on this uh, framework and we've looked at, for example, the experiences of CPSI. We've looked at other frameworks, for example, uh, uh, colleagues in Chwane, uh, you know, municipality or district uh, or metro, uh, engage with us on, on how they have developed uh, a kind of maturity, maturity framework. Our maturity framework is essentially rooted in the tradition of understanding what is called learning capabilities. So learning capabilities we understand within the, in the innovation studies is about learning to learn and learning within organizations and reflective self-learning. Now these concepts are all really, really, very complicated, but if you do not understand the notion of learning capabilities, it will be very hard to understand what the Municipal Innovation Maturity Index is, is all about. From 
that we move uh, clockwise to the next uh, bubble, which is the pink bubble about innovation uh, engagement instrument, which is really the self-reflection learning instrument that is underpinning it. And from there, we go to the processing of the information, which is often referred to as survey analysis. From that, we develop all these maturity indicators or maturity score. Now, the differences between what Mimi is doing and most of the others is it has built into itself a kind of what we call a learning forum. A learning forum enables engagement across different municipalities. And we have done quite a lot of work in the first, phase, first and second phases of experimentation with, with, the, with the platform. But ultimately, what Mimi is trying to do is that last uh, yellow bubble there on the left hand side is the uptake use of the decision support, which is the concept that has been utilized quite extensively throughout the conversation until now, which is institutionalization. Now, institutionalization has not been accomplished yet, but we hope that we'll be able to accomplish that. And I'm sure uh, Professor Vieni is going to speak a little bit more about that. Now, if you want to drill down into, into the mechanics of it, you basically have to understand that in action or in practice, MIMI is essentially uh, uh, rooted in the idea of reflective learning, both self-learning and shared learning. In other words, how do people learn from each other to discover new ideas of how to do things better? And eventually it is about that last bubble, which is the uptake and really incorporation into policy change. You cannot have policy change if you do not interact and if you don't share ideas across uh, the, the municipal officials at the, at the, at the core. Now to, to operationalize this, to put it into action, the platform, it is essentially a two or three dimensional framework that, that we have to have in mind. On the one hand is this idea of what we call maturity levels. So there are different maturity levels that we are trying to look at and these maturity levels, I'll uh, sort of say more about it in the next two slides. Uh, and in addition to the maturity levels, these maturity levels can be looked at at two different uh, levels of so, or what we call substantive science, technology, and innovation activity or actions. On the one hand, we have a dimension, what we call an organizational dimension. So our organization's learning and our organization uh, will innovation within an organizational environment broadly go to higher levels of maturity. In addition to that is what we call the individual innovation capability dimension. Now, Meme presented in, in one of his slides some of the data on the what we call barriers or constraint to innovation. What is interesting and what is surprising is that there are three or four barriers that link to individual behavior within an organization. How, in other words, different municipal officials behave and the extent to which that can either be constraining or facilitating to innovation. Now that is incorporated into this particular platform uh, in a way that has not been done uh, be before in a very, very dynamic manner. Now, here I'm sort of spending a little bit of time on the uh, maturity levels to show one of the, both the basics as well as the evolution and how we have advanced from uh, very simple maturity levels to more refined maturity levels. Why am I doing this? It is to illustrate the flexibility or adaptability built into the uh, index platform or into the, the instrument as it stands. So very often when, to, when we talk about innovation maturity, we have to talk about innovation along a continuum or a, a, along a kind of ladder of development, uh, an, an evolutionary ladder. So we start at very low levels of maturity, and that is what we did in the IPRD program showcased in our opening video and that the DG spoke about quite extensively. In these particular cases, we have very limited, and what we've discovered is this very limited understanding and awareness of innovation within these municipalities. But this is basically uh, as a result of the fact that the IPRDP program, all the service delivery innovations demonstrated in that video, they were given or thrown into these municipalities. I'm not going to detail the processes behind it, but that is basically people were recipients of innovations. There was very little that came up as a result of uh, innovative activity within the municipalities itself. But as we proceeded with the learning forums of the first IPRTP program, we discovered that there were actually a lot of innovations happening within municipalities that we have not been able to capture. And what MIMI does, MIMI enables that kind of capturing. But that is really at the low level if you just do innovation, if you're aware of innovation, or if you just manage innovation. And what we discovered, a lot of the municipalities are actually managing innovation, but there is very little shared learning taking place. In other words, are you sharing these innovations with outsiders? 
And I think this is a, a big departure point for, for Mimi. It's, in other words, it's not inward looking, it's outward looking and how to change the system. But what we did with one of the learning forums when this, the, this digital phase started was we wanted to understand, are we actually, uh, are, are these messages resonating with the actual officials on the ground and with what the leadership uh, actually would require within the municipalities? And as a result of that, municipality leadership uh, re recommended massive changes in these maturity levels. And we also have had uh, changes in what we call the organizational individual level constructs, but the changes uh, are now a little bit more nuanced in order to kind of get a closer view of how actual learning uh, is actually happening. Uh, so we have fine-tuned the maturity levels to document more carefully different phases and stages of learning in order for us to better understand maturity. So the Municipal Innovation Maturity Index, therefore, is really geared toward understanding ways in which we can enable learning. So there is, of course, a tremendous amount of measurement involved, but measurement is not an end in itself, but a means to an end. And this is my, my final slide. That is why I'm saying it's, it's, it's one slide. What do we actually need and, and why we, we went into this particular venture was to understand and document these learning capabilities that are really the anchors of moving developmental states or capable developmental states to higher levels of capability, to higher levels of maturity. Now, this can be applied in different, different spheres. At the moment, the CPSI uh, utilizes a framework that is uh, really uh, oriented to large scale kinds of projects and not through this kind of interactive engagement with, uh, with officials uh, uh, you know, over time. What is essential of this learning process is the reflective learning process, which is done through what we call these learning forums, built into the uh, Municipal Innovation Maturity Index. And uh, without the learning forum, uptake, use, and actual reflection on the usefulness of innovation in the local government sphere or local government sector is really virtually impossible. But we have discovered one or two things of areas where the, improve, where, the, where the instrument of the platform must be strengthened. The first area is really, we call, it's, it's formulated in a very technical way there through a statistical uh, measurement uh, approach, which is about sam the sample size problem and the unit of observation. So even though we have validated the instrument uh, through various itemized testing uh, uh, processes, really very, very uh, you know, complicated technical work, uh, we are still worried about what we call the unit of observation, which is essentially, we do not have enough municipalities embracing it and uh, participating in it. And so this presentation is really part of a call to invite greater participation. The, se the, the, the second one is about how to weight the score so that it reflects more accurately what is, what is happening within a municipality. And that is directly linked to the final part that I think we, we increasingly value as important, what, what we refer to currently as the missing dimension of institutional governance. Meme spoke briefly about this, but this is an area that we're working on to strengthen the platform and the instrument. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I did not interrupt you. You ran over time very slightly, um, and I know you felt under pressure. Um, and I didn't interrupt you because I actually think that what you were presenting was very germane to this whole seminar, um, especially that, you know, the, that kind of flow chart, if you like, of the different levels of maturity. Um, I see Lundfall's capability and learning theories all over the document. I mean, maybe you are very familiar with Lundfall's work, but He's um, a kind of founder of Africa Lix and very a central person in innovation policy, but he talks a lot about learning and capability. Um, and that's very much fundamental to your ice cream diagram. Um, so any case, thank you. I didn't, uh, like I said, I didn't interrupt you. I wanted you to finish. Um, and we probably have pinched some time now from the question and answer session. So let's just continue. I'm gonna to go to the next speaker um, who's gonna be talking to us. Let me just pull up my notes. Um, so Dr. Andrew Ockham, um, and I'll give you a brief uh, intro. Andrew has a doctorate in policy and development studies from UKZN. He works as a science officer at the university. 
Um, and before that, he worked as a senior researcher with the Morris Webb Race Relations Institute, where he led impact assessment and trained public officials in monitoring and evaluation. So Mimi is very much about monitoring and evaluation. Andrew, I think that's sufficient from me. Um, we certainly want to hear from you because there's been a number of questions about how mun uh, municipal authorities can engage with MIMI and whether they have access to the documents and how they can become part of the program. So hopefully you're going to answer all of those questions for us. Um, yeah, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, many thanks, David, uh, for that introduction. And thanks a lot to Peter for laying the groundwork for me in terms of um, providing the, the, the background information about um, uh, MIMI. So my presentation focuses on uh, presenting uh, what we found from the implementation testing uh, of uh, the uh, MIMI um, instrument. Okay. So what is the purpose of the presentation? First is to provide an overview of MIMI, which uh, Peter has touched on uh, already. I will also share the pre preliminary results of the implementation testing, um, and then the report as a model. Um, and it's important to, to mention that, that what we're presenting is a model of how uh, the Munic Municipal Innovation Practices Report could be produced uh, once we roll out uh, the, the, the MIMI index uh, nationally. We also show uh, how a feedback to municipalities look like. And important to point out that all the contents of my presentation uh, focuses on the implementation uh, testing phase of the MIMI. So MIMI uh, briefly is an initiative of uh, the DSI as has been mentioned previously. Uh, it promotes a process of self-reflection and shared learning on innovation practices among uh, municipal officials. It, is, it seeks to enhance the innovation capacities of uh, municipalities and uh, their officials to stimulate and support innovation. MIMI assesses the innovation maturity levels of municipalities and their officials and the end goal is to improve uh, the processes of service delivery to the community. The earlier version of the framework, as has been mentioned, was developed by the HSRC. And to build on the success of the earlier version, uh, the Department of Science and Innovation Commission, UKZN, HSRC, and SALGA to uh, facilitate a sector-wide uh, scale-up via an online, online platform. So MIMI instrument has um, four sections. Uh, the first section uh, looks at the profiles of participating officials. Uh, that's those who complete the instrument, what uh, demographic information do they uh, present? And then there's a section that looks at uh, municipal arrangements for innovations. Uh, the third section is divided into three constructs uh, for assessing the innovation maturity levels of municipalities. It has construct A, which looks at enablers of innovation. Construct B looks at man manager support for innovation. And the last section looks at individual innovation behavior. Each construct comprises a set of uh, self-assessment questions. And uh, looking at these questions, officials are able to assess themselves and their municipalities and give us information in terms of how they perform against each item in each construct of uh, the MIMI index. And as Peter has already alluded, the, uh, there are six levels, maturity levels of uh, the MIMI index, maturity level one to level six. So the implementation testing builds on the piloting of MIMI, which happened in 2020, and ha has been mentioned previously because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was very low participation. The pilot phase examined the applicability and feasibility of MIMI in collecting information that is needed to benchmark municipalities and their officials in terms of their innovation maturity. The pilot phase uh, involved 16 officials from seven provinces uh, spread across four metros, three districts, and uh, six local municipalities. For the implementation testing phase, although we had an in initial limited number of municipalities we wanted to target, uh, because of the experiences of the pilot phase and the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic, we decided to extend it to all uh, municipalities in the country. So in the implementation testing phase, uh, we started with the process of creating an awareness, and part of that was uh, an invitation from SALGA 
uh, to municipal managers, which basically was asking them to nominate uh, innovation champions from their municipalities. And the innovation champions, their primary responsibilities include being uh, the point of contact or the contact person within each municipalities, and also to promote communication between uh, um, uh, municipal officials and the MIMI project uh, team throughout the implementation testing phase, so that if there are challenges or there, there are issues that require classification, they become the point of contact that will help us to reach out to those who require further clarification. So following the communique, we received the 43 nominations of innovation champions. And then we held um, a briefing workshop with the innovation, innovation champions. And the intention was to familiarize them with the tools, with, with, with the MIMI tool, and also to take them through the process and also to answer their questions in terms of any issues of concern about how to involve their, their, their municipal officials. Um, during the planning for the implementation testing, um, we made the process completely voluntary and our target audience was at least 50 officials per municipality. Um, during the implementation testing uh, phase, uh, we sent out um, a reminder to um, every, uh, every week to uh, the innovation champions and also followed up with telephonic calls where needed. Um, despite all our intentions and uh, the activities that we engaged in in preparing for the implementation testing, uh, when the testing period closed, we received participation from only 55 officials uh, from 18 municipalities across the country. The highest participation was from the city of Chuane, uh, 15 officials. And because of the low participation rate, uh, we could, uh, it means that um, no municipality reached a threshold of 30 participants. And um, important to point out that uh, the, the underlying assumption of the MIMI index is that a minimum of 30 participants from a municipality is needed uh, for us to be able to develop a robust maturity level. So a few challenges that we experienced uh, during the process, the first one, uh, which I've alluded to, is a limited number of response because municipal officials were preoccupied with responding to the challenges of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And we had uh, a number of technical issues uh, because uh, this was the uh, first time we were uh, testing out the online tool. Uh, one of them prevented uh, officials from the district level uh, from participating in, in the implementation testing during the first uh, two weeks. So I'm now going to focus on the profiles of uh, the participants. Um, as you can see here, we had the participation from uh, six uh, provinces uh, with the uh, highest proportion from uh, Hauteng followed by the Western Cape. Upumalanga had uh, the least. Here we present an overview in terms of the category of municipality. And as you can see here, nearly um, every three, uh, three in every five participants were from the local uh, level of government. Uh, this uh, pie chart shows uh, the gender of our participants with uh, just over 60% uh, um, being, um, being male. Here we have uh, the positions of, uh, of our participants and um, senior uh, managers uh, comprised um, on the 20% with mid middle management um, having just almost 50% um, uh, of the participants. In this figure, we show the number of years of our participants um, uh, in terms of uh, how many years they've occupied the current position. And as you can see here, the, uh, the highest proportion comes from those who have uh, five years and below in terms of their years of experience with uh, uh, just about 2% uh, with more than 20 years of experience. Um, in their current uh, position. Here we show the highest qualification of our participants, uh, highest uh, being um, deep, those with diploma or higher certificate. And we have 27% um, who have master's uh, qualification as the highest qualification. In this pie chart, um, now we move to the municipal arrangement for innovations. And in this pie chart, we ask our participants about whether um, 
innovation has been uh, incorporated into uh, municipal strategies. Uh, and, and as you can see here, um, only 16% uh, uh, um, uh, indicated that um, innovation has been incorporated into municipal strategies. And we had a uh, very high uh, non-response. And in this table, we give an indication of uh, the municipalities where the responses come from. Uh, if you can look at the first uh, uh, column, uh, it shows uh, the number of responses per municipalities who indicated that innovation is considered to be important in the municipalities. Uh, the second one, uh, innovation has been incorporated into municipal strategies. And as you can see, it's city of Tuane, Msunduzi, uh, the city of Cape Town, uh, Bedge River and Buffalo City. This pie chart uh, looks at whether a municipality has um, a dedicated unit to manage innovation. And um, just uh, under 13% um, answered yes to that question. Uh, here we show the year in which innovation unit was uh, established, the earliest being 2011 and the latest being uh, 2017. Andrew, I don't want to uh, rush you, but um, I'm going to have to. I'm going to give you another three minutes because we still have 15 minutes for Sitem Biso, um, Dr. Mnyeni, and then we've got to have five minutes, and we have to finish by two. So I'm not sure how how you're doing on your presentation. Maybe you could, um, you know, uh, skip some of the de these detailed slides on the actual survey responses and give us the main message from the survey. Thanks for that. I will wrap up just now. Uh, here, the number of people who are employed in the innovation unit. Uh, here, uh, innovation unit with champions and uh, very low response also. Uh, municipalities that have uh, low uh, innovation units and champions, very low response as well. Here, it's where the innovation projects have been implemented over the last three years, a very low response as well. And these are the municipalities that indicated that the innovation has been implemented over the past three years. And we also ask if they've established partnership with external stakeholders. And you can see example of uh, external stakeholders where partnership have been established. And these are the municipalities with established partnership and then what are the constraints to implementing innovation, mainly reg legislative red, red tapes, funding, human resources and management. Um, and these are the municipalities that reported constraint in implementing innovation. And here we move to the uh, innovation maturity levels. Uh, as you can see here, we've uh, divided the information into the overall picture, the district level, metros and local. And as you can see, uh, local level score the highest across the three constructs or door is three out of six uh, with uh, district municipality uh, scoring the lowest. Here is a table with an overview of all the municipalities that participated in the implementation testing. A deals with construct A, B is construct B, which deals with the manager support for innovation and construct C is individual innovation behavior. M shows you the maturity level. And as you can see, um, nine out of the 18 at maturity level three, uh, seven out of the 18 at maturity level uh, uh, two. So as you can see uh, from here, uh, this gives an overall picture of our participants. And this is an example of a map uh, that shows the maturity level at, um, at the provincial level. And as you can see, no participation from the city of Johannesburg and Ekorolini. Uh, Tuane maturity level three, West Rand one, and City Bank one. Uh, so this is an, uh, just a quickly an overview of the kind of feedback that we we'll give to municipalities, um, give introduction and background, including the methodology, uh, description of uh, the maturity levels with tables, uh, focusing on each of the individual items in the construct so that municipalities can see uh, which areas they are underperforming and how they can improve on those areas. These are further examples of the tables uh, looking at the, the three constructs. And in this final table, we compare uh, all the municipalities that participated so that the municipality can compare their performance with other municipalities. And then we give a definition of the maturity levels. And finally, 
a conclusion with a recommendations for areas that will require um, improvement. So that is um, just an overview of uh, what uh, of the information emerging from the implementation testing. I hope I kept to the three minutes. Um, the conclusion is mainly about how important uh, this process has been. It has enhanced the learning process towards the adoption of innovations uh, for service delivery. Um, although we did not meet the expectation rate, uh, the participation rate, it has provided valuable insights into the innovation processes within municipalities that participated. And then it has uh, demonstrated the value and the capacity of the system to produce innovation maturity levels for municipalities. We've also learned uh, valuable lessons and information that we need to take forward uh, in ways of refining the instruments um, as we move to the next phase of uh, the national rollout. Thank uh, you thank so you much, attention. Andrew. That was really interesting. Um, I'm not sure whether to be depressed or encouraged by the results of that. Um, I mean, I think it's very encouraging that the, there's this pilot program and that we have this instrument. Um, obviously, we have a long way to go in terms of maturity in the, you know, the innovation index and the maturity levels. Um, and that's what's revealed by your survey. It, it takes me back to the, that comment from the DG about the institutionalization of innovation. And I think that's, that is a key target that we need to achieve. We need to embed in innovation maybe or institutionalize it with, in using his terms. So I, I'm gonna move on then to our last speaker, Dr. Mieni, um, also from UKZN. Um, Dr. Mieni, if you're there, if you can quickly switch on your um, video and, and your, um, unmute yourself. Um, by a brief introduction, Dr. Mieni is a senior lecturer in housing um, and a research associate of the Saatchi Chair in Applied Poverty Reduction Assessment in the School of Built Environment Development Studies at UKZN. He is a co-editor of a recently published book on the political economy of government subsidized housing in South Africa. Um, and he has a, a diploma in public management, a BTEC in public management, um, a master's in development studies from UKZN and a PhD in development policy and management from University of Manchester. Sitem Biso, over to you then um, for the last talk of the day. Are you there? Uh Thank you so thank you so much, uh, Chair, uh, Pro Present Facilitator. And I think I'm building up on my presentation based on what uh, Dr. Jacobs and also Dr. Adam has already indicated. But what is uh, important here is that uh, this uh, presentation is going to give a, a way forward in terms of the rollout uh, in actual sense soon after we just completed our our testing and so. You could see in my outline of the presentation that I will be dealing with the purpose of the presentation and also the background to the national. Sitem Biso, sorry, we're losing some of the sound. Um, I think you just have to talk close to your laptop and don't swallow the sound because then we can't hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will also introduce the MIMI rollout to municipalities and also invite municipalities because the very same rollout has got some benefits which are also attached to it and also look at the maybe future direction and also I will conclude. Uh, hopefully I will finish in the next 10 minutes. So the purpose of the presentation as I've already indicated will be to provide the background of national implementation of MIMI rollout, to introduce the MIMI rollout plan to municipalities and also to share this plan whilst also encouraging uh, the full participation in the MIMI rollout and also to identify some of the benefits which are associated with the, uh, with the rollout then. Uh, just to build in the process that what Dr. Okem has already indicated, which is also going to be the very same approach that we are going to follow to this. Uh, I know that the DG has already given us a huge task also to this that hopefully we have already given municipalities who participated in the implementation testing. So that is going to be our first, uh, that is going to be our first activity 
to ensure that we provide uh, we provide feedback to municipalities through learning forum as part of the framework that we are using and also through the individual report on the basis of the example that Dr. Okem also showed to us. But whilst we are there, what is critically important since we'll be uh, starting this rollout, we are inviting municipal managers to nominate uh, innovation champions from their municipalities so that those innovation champions should serve as contact person with each municipality because that's only one way in which you can be able to promote communication between ourselves as the team and also uh, the municipalities. So far, we have already received 43 nominations on the basis and that, that were those that we have used in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the testing then. But moreover, what is going to happen is that we also do take initiative in terms of training municipal officials in terms of how to interact with the digital platform because that is crucial. But what we are also aiming uh, to this is that uh, in this uh, rollout, we are aiming that uh, in the medium term strategic framework to at least uh, uh, go beyond maybe 50%, but what we are targeting is, is at least 50 municipality, 50 officials per municipality, because we have got a threshold that can be able to assist us to be able to come with a maturity a maturity score to this. Uh, this slide, it gives us in terms of what we're planning to do in terms of phases, because we know that uh, also, uh, yeah, we, in terms of phases that we are targeting, that as we start, as we open for this, we are targeting that we need to cover all our, of our metros and 50 local municipalities together with uh, 20 districts. And in phase two, then, will embark on our local municipalities as in category as in category B and also our district municipalities as in category C. Then the last phase we will that is when then we'll be able to complete with the uh, the remainder of the of the municipalities to this. Uh, I think there's also been a question in terms of how to access uh, this instrument. So Within uh, the, 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 the project itself or the program itself, we've got a, a website that has been designed, which one can be able to have access uh, to this online tool through that uh, website. So there's been a deployment of that, uh, there's a live deployment of that website. And I will also share, and also our colleagues can also share some, some information with that then. But what is also important is that, as I've already indicated, that there will be a process that will start to embark on in terms of training mm -hmm. our officials, uh, our officials in line with the, our officials. But as I've already indicated that we are targeting, uh, our focus uh, will also be targeting those that uh, did not participate in the, uh, in the testing, but not to say that we'll exclude those who participated. I've already seen that there's been some, uh, some, some call. There's been some, some intention to participate to this, of which we really appreciate. But also within that, we'll also be embarking on the on maybe marketing, because uh, as we could see that we have got uh, an identity for for this, but at the same time we've got also some communication strategy. So all what we'll also be doing, there will be a rollout in terms of. Uh, uh, there will also be uh, some communication with municipalities where we must be using some different communication strategy to this that has also been developed uh, within the within the project itself. So there, these are there are some of these uh, benefits uh, which are, are linked to municipal participation here. One, if municipalities they participate, they will have an opportunity to interact with the instrument because they can be able to learn and reflect on their innovation capabilities for improved service delivery. Two municipalities will get feedback, which will also include recommendation to municipalities on how then they, they can plan for innovation, integrate innovation in, in their strategies and also in plans. But there will also be some municipal feedback will also help municipalities to think of ways to manage innovation ideas and also to institutionalize innovation and also to develop plans that will be able to assist them to migrate from 
a lower maturity level to higher maturity level. But also at the same time, their participation, I think the DG also uh, indicated some, also identified something here. Yeah? But what is also important is that their participation will also uh, assist them in taking advantage of applying for innovation support through DSI innovation uh, funding instruments such as the Technology Acquisition and Deployment Fund. But there are also other programs or initiatives that are also within the DSI, uh, the Innovation for Service Delivery Program. But also their participation, I think our international speaker here spoke broadly about uh, how then it's so important to, com uh, to, to compare different municipalities so that they can be able to understand. And that also assist in terms of applying the very same framework in terms of uh, those learnings and so forth in, through the learning forums. Uh, but also, there are also a lot of other activities which are also within the project itself. Uh, because one, we also want to, Dr. Jacobs also outlined the aspect about the fact that we have not yet institutionalized. So in terms of the other plan, as we proceed with the project, we'll still want to identify a potential host for, for Mimi. But whilst also doing that, then I'm sure that once we've been able to follow all the criteria that we've developed, we can be able to, to then launch that host institution. But also in the process, as Dr. Jacobs and also uh, Dr. Okem also highlighted the issue about scores, the maturity scores and so forth. And within the program itself, we're also trying to establish what we call a MIMI accreditation system, which can also be able to assist us to uh, go through a very crucial event where we'll then have what we call a municipal innovation awards in order to, 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 to motivate uh, the participation in innovation there. I'm sure that once we will start to embark on that process, uh, it still can still be decided whether it is going to be an annual event for that, but I'm sure that it will also be of its first kind in South Africa. But also what is crucially important here is that uh, we have come to an understanding, and I think it has also been a call, that there is no institution that can work in isolation. So that is why in part of what we are also doing, we'll also invite public sector uh, partners to also invest in this initiative uh, because that will also be crucial. And also as already indicated that MIMI support other DSI innovation funding instruments such as your technology innovation uh, fund. Uh, in conclusion, uh, is that the success of the rollout will also depend on the leadership support at municipal level. So we are calling upon municipalities to also support uh, this uh, invite so that we can be able to be successful because it's one part to have a tool, but then if the tool cannot be utilized, then that would be very disappointing. So that's why then we are arguing, we are appealing that uh, we invite leaders to support us to this. But also the success of the introduction of the Municipal Innovation Awards will also be prepared that upon the participation of municipalities to that, because that will allow the generation us to generate the mature which we can be able to incentivize performers whilst also providing a motivation for improvement. But also the participation of municipalities to this will also allow comparing different municipalities because that is where they will start to understand what is it that can they can be able to, to work on with an intention to uh, to improve them. I think one critical point that is important here since we want to embark in the process of the, uh, of the rollout, we are now inviting municipalities to register their interest on the basis of the email that is given so that you can be able to consolidate and also then make a follow-up with those municipalities. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair, for your, for your time. Thank you so much, Sutembi. So there was ongoing problems with the sound. I'm not sure what it was. It actually, it wasn't the way in which you were projecting your voice. It was something to do with your microphone. Uh, it, I don't know. In any case, um, 
they, I'm sure that there are lots of questions and answers and we're not going to have time at all to deal with them. Um, but I just wanted to, at this point, thank all the attendees and the presenters for a really interesting and engaging seminar. Um, I think that the, if I were to have any comments at all, maybe we had inadequate time really to look in more detail at the MIMI reports and the implementation and the lessons learned and um, what the future directions will be. Because um, I think that that is part of this, a very important part of this process of institutionalizing innovation and improving public service delivery. So um, maybe that's for another day, but I'm now going to hand over to our final speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Tiani in Gobani, who I know is present. Um, I can see his so, Tiani, if you'd like to um, unmute yourself and turn on your video um, and just give the final closing <laughs> remarks. There you go. Okay. Good. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. And good afternoon to the colleagues and everyone who, who, who managed to be with us. I think we did not have enough time, I think, to, to go through all the questions that are there, I think, on the question on the chat box but however we'll try and make time that we, we arrange follow-up uh, sessions we can do learning forums we can do i think iid seminars so we'd like to thank uh, everyone who made time uh, from their busy schedule um, we know that there are people from national government, provincial government, local government, and municipalities. We know that there are people from the private sector, institutions of higher learning, our science councils, and also uh, the international partners that we have there on the system. So we'd really like to thank you for being with us when we do this uh, launch of the national rollout of our disinterpret tool which is called MIMI. Secondly, we'd really like to thank the DSI, uh, which is my department, for the continued support and the investment that I'm making through the system. Uh, it assists us as a country to come up with uh, DC support tools, like the one which we are rolling, uh, one we are launching today. Thirdly, we'll really, we are grateful for the partnership that we're having with the UKZN, HSRC, uh, SALGA, and also the different roles that are playing in making sure that we scale up this tool. And then we also like to thank ASAF for hosting us, for making sure that everything runs smoothly uh, during uh, this webinar. And then we'll also like to thank you, Prof, for, the, for leading the agenda, for the good facilitation uh, that we had today. Uh, I know that it was, <laughs> the time was not on our side, but you managed to keep us within the time frame that we have planned. And then also like to thank Mr. Musia for giving us uh, the opening remarks and also giving us um, the opening platform and the purpose of what is it that we're doing doing today and also our international uh, guest speaker prof uh, Mehmet for giving us an insight in terms of the international perspective of uh, the in um, innovation maturities that are there the, the maturity indexes that are there in the world it also assists us in terms of benchmarking on how uh, far the world has gone and and where we are as uh, south africa as a whole and i also want to thank our dg dr phil for giving us uh, the keynote address in terms of the strategic in intervention of the dsi and also giving us um, what uh, the decadal plan has to offer and we also like to thank the messages of support from UKZN and also HSRC as their partners in implementation uh, of this project. We also thank uh, the word uh, from Mr. Nketli for giving us an overview uh, of South African Smart Cities Framework. And then also Dr. Jacobs, uh, Dr. Okem, and also Dr. Mieni, they gave us um, more insight in terms of the tool. But even though we did not have much time to engage with them, but I'm sure hopefully we're going to do, I think, follow-up sessions into it. And then um, I would like to say that all the presentations that were presented today will be shared uh, with the participants and also the report which was uh, presented by Dr. Okem as well will be shared uh, by, uh, with the participant. So with that, Prof, uh, I would really like to thank everyone who managed to, 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 to attend the session. And then with those words, I think the meeting is urgent. Thank you so much uh, and let's all be safe. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. Be safe. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Lovely. And thank you for a lovely session. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.